So uh, good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Marlos. I work at Platform Attack, and I'm here today to talk uh, about building efficient data pipelines in Elixir. So uh, before I begin, I just want to say that I'm very excited uh, to see the previous uh, talk from Emerson, and it's really satisfying to see technology that you build being used by companies in production, solving real problems. So that's the whole point. And I'm really glad that I'm being, I've been meeting people here that say, oh, we are using broad in production. It's great, it's stable. And it's, it's really nice to have that feedback. So here's our agenda. So we first gonna try to start with some basic concepts. So this is important to give you some context before we move to the implementation details, which are more advanced topics. So we are gonna focus on fault tolerance and graceful shutdown uh, when we are talking about those details because I think it's the most important one. And it's usually the, the, the ones that are really tricky when you try to, to solve these kind of problems. Um, then at last, uh, I will show you a new feature that we're working on, which is the integration with telemetry. So uh, what is Broadway? So Broadway is an open source tool de developed by Platform Attack that aims to streamline data processing pipelines. But uh, that's beautiful, but what is a, a data pipeline? A data pipeline is a set of data processing elements connected in series uh, where the output of one element is the input of the next one. So here's a simple example. Uh, imagine you have an application and you want to collect data from the users. I mean, collect statistics from the users so you can maybe later <clears throat> use that information to use in a machine learning engine or whatever. So one approach you could do is actually use your main endpoint from the application and send that information along with the information from the application itself. Uh, the problem is that uh, this approach, depending on how you process that, 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 that information, uh, might have a very negative impact in the response time because you're receiving data from the application, you're receiving data that is not directly uh, related to your application and you're processing that information. So maybe the response time will increase, maybe a failure in one of those uh, processing can influence the other one. So a better approach would be to, instead of using your main endpoint, you use a separate endpoint and just send that data to a queue. Uh, in this case, it could be SQLs, it could be RebTMQ, or whatever Kafka, whatever you need. So here is where Broder comes in. So the idea uh, is that you can use Broder to streamline that process to create that pipeline. So in our example here, we have all that information that you gather from the user. We send it to SQLs so it can be processed asynchronously later without, uh, without having any relation to the actual flow of the, the, your application. So <clears throat> the pipeline you need to create needs to consume those messages from SQS. You will have some kind of processing. You can transform the data. And then you're probably going to upload that data, that result, the result into a S3 bucket. So then later can your machine learning engine read that information and do whatever it wants. 
So why broader? Why, why platform attack decided to invest in such a tool? Well, one thing that we realized uh, is, was that many companies were using Elixir to build processing data pipelines. So we saw a lot of companies using GenStage, which is a great tool. Actually, broader, it's built on top of GenStage. But uh, uh, it, that, the concurrent uh, nature the concurrent nature of Elixir, uh, along with GenStage, make it actually a perfect fit for this kind of problems to define uh, data, pipe, data uh, processing pipelines. So what we saw was that many of those uh, companies were like re-implementing the same features over and over. So everybody that was talking to us, oh, I implemented this like this, like that, and then in order to implement those features, <clears throat> they end up assembling very complex gen stage uh, pipelines. So uh, in order to get that, all the features that they want, they needed to create that complex, uh, adding more stages, and then they start running into the same pitfalls. So here are some examples of some of those features, right? I mean, if you want to process uh, data efficiently, you need concurrency, you need back pressure, so you don't want to drain all resources from your machine. You're probably going to need batching, especially if you work with, uh, for instance, S3. You can improve, like, in an order of magnitude the throughput if you use batching instead of sending message by message. So graceful shutdown is something that is really important and is kind of hard to implement. And you also want to consume from different sources. I mean, you want to consume data from SQS, RepMQ, Kafka, and many other uh, sources. So some of those features can really make it hard to maintain your pipeline. So let's take back pressure, for example. GenStage has a built-in mechanism for back pressure. However, if you're using RabbitMQ and you want to consume messages uh, efficiently from RabbitMQ, you should not use, you should not pull messages by yourself. You should use an active client that will receive messages as, as they come, as they arrive. The problem is that you lose back pressure at least the, the mechanism that it's building for gen stage, you cannot use it because you, can, you don't control the, the messages that are coming. So you need to use RabbitMQ prefetch count in order to do this. So even though gen, gen stage has already a solution, it doesn't apply for RabbitMQ if you want to consume data efficiently. Batching, I mean, if you, if, batch is another example. If you want to, to create batches from your messages efficiently, you need to create more stages. Otherwise, if you try to do in the same stage, you're going to just stop the flow to create your batches, which is bad. So you want concurrency. Graceful shutdown gets even more interesting because you're going to need an external process to control that. If I want to shut down my pipeline without losing data, I will need an external process to do that, to synchronize how each step of the pipeline can safely be shut down, flush their message, then go into another one. So in this case, it's interesting because that process, that, that process doesn't belong to the pipeline, but it has to belong to the same supervision tree. So it started getting really complicated as you add more features. <clears throat> so in order to define those pipelines, you basically need to answer those three questions, which are basically the, the, the questions that during development we were facing. I mean, we need to solve those problems. So the first one is how to define the right topology 
for the pipeline. And in case of Brother, it's even more complicated because Brother is supposed to be a library. So we don't know actually the problem you, you, you're trying to solve. So you need to have some kind, you need to have a way to define the topology and work for many different cases. Uh, how to structure the supervision tree cor correctly? I mean, we want to have fault tolerance in a pipeline. I mean, if I want to, to if I have a failure in one of the, the, the stages, how should I, how the supervisor should work in order to restart parts of the pipeline, parts of the system that could come back in a stable state? So we're going to start with the first one uh, and how we will address this in broadly. So how to define the right topology for the pipeline. The idea is quite simple. What you have in Broadway, it's a configuration. You have a behavior. And then you, create the, you let Broadway create the pipeline for you. So instead of using GenStage and manually creating your pipeline, you have a standard way to define the topology. It's using a configuration. And then you implement a behavior just like a, a Gen, uh, a gen server. You have callbacks, you implement those callbacks, you inject your code, and then the pipeline will behave as you want. So here's an example. That's how it looks like. So you use Broadway, which is a behavior. You, you pass the configuration you want, which will define the topology. <clears throat> and you implement the callbacks. So that's the code that has your business logic. So taking a closer look, this would be a configuration, a very simple configuration. This is the, the, the simplest topology that you can create with Broadway. So we just have, uh, we define one group of producers called DFO. Uh, the module of the producer is a counter. Counter can be a gen stage producer, uh, if you already have one. And that, that group of producers, we have two stages. And the processes, we also have a group of processes called DFO with three stages. So it's a very simple pipeline. Here we have a more complex pipeline because now we want to use batches. As I told you, you can get an order of magnitude improvement in throughput if you use batches when working with uh, S3. Most of the service from Amazon, you can work with batches. So in that case, the topology is going to change because now I'm defining two batches. So the first one, I'm just defining one producer. I'm defining two processors. Then I'm defining one batch, one batcher called SQS with two stages. So I'm going to start receiving messages. I'm going to process those messages. And depending on, on some kind of information that I can retrieve from the message, I will forward that message to SQS. In some other cases, I want to send them to S3. So that's what's going to happen. So those messages will be forwarded to right batcher according to that information. So here's a quick demo to demonstrate how, the, how you can define a topology using, uh, through the configuration. So I probably better come to this one. This is a dashboard, a simple dashboard uh, was implemented using live view. And for now, we just care about this one, which is the configuration. We have only four uh, options here. But since everything to def that defines the topology is in that configuration, you could add all the other options here. So you can change the topology. You can say, OK, let's three producers. <clears throat> four processes, 
three batcher consumers for S3, and maybe an 04 for SQS. So, and then now we have, uh, uh, we, we changed the topology of the, of the pipeline. So this pipeline probably gonna, <coughs> uh, gonna be able to process much, uh, a, a large number of messages, at least in comparison to the, the first one. <clears throat> I, I, you need to forgive me about my voice, but I recently had uh, damaged my vocal cords, so it's been really hard for me to get to this tone, so please forgive me. <laughs> I'm not fully recovered. So we're talking about two parts when you, you, you need to, implement, to do two, two things when you're using Broadway. So the first one is to define the configuration, and the second one <clears throat> is to implement the behavior. So we need to implement the callbacks. So one important thing that you need to, to pay attention here is that unlike uh, Gen Server, uh, where the callbacks will run in the same process, or handle info, handle call, whatever, will run in the same process, with uh, Broadway, it, it's not like this. Uh, each callback will be executed in a different process. For example, the handle message is the callback that will be executed for each message that will be retrieved from the producer. So the producer will get 100 messages, so it will run the handle message for each one of them. And in this case, they will run in the processors. In this example, we are using batches. So inside the handle message is where I say, OK, I want to forward that message if it's a message that contains this kind of information. I want to send to SQS. Otherwise, I want to send to S3. So now it's going to be forwarded to a different process in the pipeline. It's S3. And then have a handle batch. So handle batch will run in another process, which are the batch consumers, which is like which is the batch processors actually. So if the batcher is SQS, he's gonna execute this handle batch in one of those processes. If it's S3, it's gonna run in another process. So this is important to pay attention. So you cannot, you don't have state in Broadway. It's not like a gen server when you have a state and you can update the state. You cannot have state here, and you shouldn't. So <clears throat> we want to quick demonstrate this, uh, the batching, how it works. So we can change here. And then we can send some messages. Let's send 5,000 messages. We just have a naive implementation of uh, Fibonacci just to simulate CPU processing. Uh, here you can just define the percentage of messages that should be go to, the S to SKS or to S3. In this case, we're going to say that 100% of the messages should be forwarded to S3. So as you can see, uh, the whole flow, it's always going to S3. You can see that the SQS batcher doesn't even change color because it's not processing anything. So you have the producers. The producers are retrieving message from, from RabbitMQ, and then it could go to any, uh, uh, any one of the processors. But then inside the processes, we say, OK, this one should go to SQS or should go to S3. So with this, we answer the first question, how to define the right topology for the pipeline. Now we need to answer the second one, how to structure the supervision tree correctly. So here's an example of a supervision tree of a Broadway pipeline. 
since it's a lot of information, we're going to, say, we, we're going to take a look uh, at each supervisor individually. So the first one is the main. This is the main supervisor. We're using the strategy uh, REST for one. Uh, and you can see that we have a supervisor for each of the steps. You have a producer supervisor, processor supervisors, and a batch supervisor. Uh, the last one, the terminator, we're gonna, uh, uh, we're gonna talk about it later on the talk. But for now, uh, the one thing you need to have in mind is that we use the rest for one strategy for that. The rest for one strategy works like this. If one of the children fail, the children will be restarted and, every, and, and all the children define it after these children will also be restarted. So in this case, if the process supervisor failed because the student also failed or for any other reason, all the other children will also be restarted. And this is a very conservative uh, approach, uh, but we need this because it, you shouldn't, th those things shouldn't actually crash because those are generic code. And even the code that's not generic, if you're using the, the, all the code that you have inside the, the callbacks, they are wrapped by a try catch. So you shouldn't have any trouble here. So if you really have a trouble here, if it, that process fail, it's better to just restart everything and try to get to a, a stable uh, state again. So the producer supervisor, the producer, producer supervisor takes another approach because each producer, if I say I want to have four, five producers to retrieve message from RabbitMQ, each one of them are completely in the, independent from each other. So each producer will hold its own connection and open its own channel. So we need, it's better to use the one for one because in the case of one for one, if one of the children dies, only that children will be restarted by the supervisor. Which makes sense, since they are independent, they don't share state. If one of them fail, I want to keep receiving message from the other ones. The processor supervisor uses another strategy. We already used the three strategies we have for, for supervisors. In this case, we're gonna use the one for all. As I told you, all the code that runs inside the callbacks, it's wrapped in a try catch. So we capture any kind of error that could happen inside the callbacks, which makes sense because all code we have in Brodo belongs to us, but the code that runs inside the callbacks, it's the code from the user. We don't have access to that code, so it makes sense to wrap it. And if there's an error, we're going to, to mark the message as failed and going to move on. So in this case, if something happens, if there is a crash in the processor, it's something, it, it's a buggy in Broadway. So it's not supposed to happen. So in that case, if that happens, the one for all will just restart everything. And in this case, since you have max restarts zero, it will actually shut down, uh, you actually restart the supervisor. I'm sorry. And since you have rest for one, it will actually restart the whole thing. Uh, batch repetition supervisor also use the one for one, just like the producers. Why? Because each batcher is completely independent from each other. They don't share state, so we can safely restart one if it fails. We don't have to, to, to restart the other one. And then you have the batcher consumer, which is, again, rest for one, because we have the batcher, which is one process that we saw in the pipeline before, and we have the, the other process that will process those batches, which are the batcher consumers. So if there is a problem in the batcher, I can no longer trust the information that I have, which makes sense. I mean, it's a pipeline. So just like a pi pipeline in a factory, if one of the steps fail, the other steps are compromised, so if the batcher fails, I have no idea that if the information I have is safe. So failing the batcher, you should also restart 
uh, all the consumers. And the last one is, uh, is, the one for, uh, is the consumer supervisor. So it's one for all again, just like the processors. Why? Because it's not supposed to crash. There is no code there that should run that is not trapped in, in a, in a tri-cat. So if it crashes, it cra the, the problem was in Broadway. And if the problem is in Broadway, Broadway, it's better to restart the whole thing. Even the supervisor itself. So with this, we, 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 we answered the second question. So how to structure supervision tree cor cor correctly? So it's a very conservative approach because we know what we have. We know the code we have, and we know what parts of the code doesn't belong to us. Uh, for instance, the producer, we don't, we don't have access to the code. The producer, the producer can be implemented by anybody. It could consume data for anywhere, so it can crash. The consumer might hold a connection. The connection might be unstable. And in this case, we expect an error. But otherwise, in other places, like in the processors or in the batcher consumers, we don't expect an error. The last question is how to handle grace for shutdown without data loss. And that's where we come back into the terminator. I told you before that in order to have grace for shutdown, you cannot trust in your pipeline. You need a separated process to synchronize how all the stages should be shut down. So what we want to do is that, OK, if I want to upgrade my system, I don't want to lose messages, or maybe I don't want to duplicate messages. It will depend in what kind of server you use and what strategy you're using. But if I just want to upgrade my, my system, I don't want to be worried about if I'm going to lose messages or not. So basically, the grace of shutdown, it's OK. I'm going to tell the system that it's going to be shut down, but I want to process all the messages that are in the pipeline. And it's important to notice that you might have thousands of messages in the pipeline, because each stage has a buffer. And you might have a lot of messages in those buffers. So it's an important feature for us. This was something that I remember talking to Jose. He said, no, we have to do this, because this is, the, this is the, probably the single feature that most people get it wrong. So the first step in, uh, for the grace of shutdown, for the terminator, is to to tell the processors to stop subscribing to the producers. Why that happened? Because when you, you're trying to do grace for shutdown, since you have a lot of messages in the pipeline, uh, it might take a couple of seconds to process all those messages. And during that period of time, maybe a connection fail, so we're going to get a new producer that's going to be restarted by the supervisor. So if that happens during the shutdown, the processor will try to resubscribe again. So the first important thing to do is say processes do not resubscribe. The second step is then cancel and shut down the producers. So in order to do this, we need to tell the producer to first stop receiving messages. So we have a callback. If you want to implement a new producer, you have a callback, which is uh, called uh, prepare for draining, where you tell the, the terminator tell, look, producer, please don't get any more messages, because I'm going to shut down the pipeline. Then we tell uh, to stop accepting demand. So <clears throat> there's no, since I'm going to shut down, there's no need to get more demand. If I receive demand, I'm just going to ignore it, just going to accumulate it, that demand, because I'm, go, I'm only going to process the message that I already have. And then you have to flush the events in a buffer, right? So we don't want to lose any message. And then finally, we cancel the consumers. So the last step is to the, the terminator monitors the last uh, set of stages from the pipeline, right? Because <clears throat> when you cancel the producers, when, when in gen stage, if, the, if a consumer realized that all its producers were canceled, 
it will cancel itself. It will process the message that it has already, and then it will cancel itself. So with this, we actually, when you cancel the, the, the processes, we actually create an, a cascade effect. So after canceling the processes, then the batch is going to realize, oh, there's no, I'm, 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 there, there's no more producers. In, in this case, the producers of the batches were the processors. So in each step of the pipeline, you just start to flush in their messages, processing their messages, until the last set of stages, which is the, the one that processes the batches, will also be canceled and die. So in that moment, since the terminator is monitoring that and waiting for them to die, then you say, okay, now I can, I can also die. And then find the producers. So if you take a look at the, the supervision tree and the rest for one strategy that we use, you can see why the terminator is the last one. Because in OTP, when a, uh, the supervisor is going to shut down his children, it, it always is going to shut down in the reverse order that they were created. So what we're doing here, actually, it's cheating the default implementation of the shutdown. So the supervisor gets a signal, I'm going to shut down my children. When the signal gets the terminator, which is the first one that should be shut down, the terminator actually trap exits. And then inside the terminator callback, he will do all that things that we saw before. So we'll cancel the producers, ask to her subscribe, stop receiving the man. So in somehow the terminator actually do a, a, a cheat the supervisor and say, look, wait for me. Don't stop the other children. I'm going to do this. One thing that you can see here is that why it's important graceful shutdown. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to send some messages here, let's say 20,000 messages. So the pipeline is working, right? So I'm actually going to purge this and reset because I want to have the, okay, I want to have all them zero. So, so what are you going to do here is to send 10,000 messages, right? And while the pipeline is running, we're actually going to change the, the, the topology. We're going to say, okay, I'm going to have one producer, I'm going to put five, uh, maybe three here, whatever. And then we change the topology while the pipeline is running, as you can see. And it keeps actually working because we have grace for shutdown. In order to do this, we actually shut down the pipeline and then you start again with the new configuration. That's much easier than try to synchronize this without shutting down the pipeline. So as you can see, I sent 10,000 messages. I changed the topology of the pipeline, and we got all the 10,000 messages without losing anyone. So, this way, we answer the, the, the third challenge that we have. So with this, I think it was the basic that, the, I think there was the important aspects of broader that I think it's, you, you should know about, because these are the trickiest one that we need to face when you want to roll your own solution. And the last thing I want to show you today is the new feature that we're working on, which is the integration with telemetry. We actually already seen this in the demo. So as I told you, this is a dashboard, uh, it's a live view dashboard, and we have two different kinds of metrics here. We have the throughput, that it's actually how many messages you can process per second, and then you have, uh, for each stage, you have a relation between the processing time and the idle time. 
So that can help you to, to find bottlenecks in your pipeline. So we can try very quick here. Uh, let's see. Let's start with a very bad pipeline. And let's just send 100,000 messages. Oh, actually, I'm going to purge this because it's everything set to, the, to S3. You don't want that. We want here, it's uh, maybe send 20% of those messages to S3. That would be better. Yeah, and maybe 100 here so we can have, you simulate I.O., just, just put in a delay in the battery processors. Okay, so I sent the message, and, and as you can see, it's a very bad pipeline. I mean, you can only get to 120 messages per second because you only have one uh, process in, in each step. And as you can see, even the second, the, the, the second one, which is the processor, it, it still blinks. So you're actually not using the, the, the CPU. You can also see in the CPU, uh, the, the usage of the CPU, that there are a lot of things uh, that you can do. The, the bottleneck here, it's the last one that you can see that doesn't even blink. It's the red one in the end. It's the last stage, which is the, the, the batch processor. So what you can do is try to increase that. So let's see if we get some, some improvement. All right, we got some improvement. So now you can see the bottleneck is not the batch processor anymore. So the bottleneck is probably the processor. We have only one processor, which is red. I mean, it's processing all the time. So we can do something about this as well. We can increase the number of processes. Then you can get some better results. You still can see that the processes are not, they're still blinking, right? So we probably can add a few more producers. Maybe you can get a little bit more because And maybe we can also add a little bit more here for here. And then, so this is the integration that the laboratory that we're working on. There is still, we're still playing around and experimenting some of the metrics, but the goal here is actually give you a set of tools that you can use to improve your pipeline because you need to know exactly what to do when you're working with, with, with this kind of situation. I mean, you need to know your data, you need to know for instance, if you just want to set 100 producers, it's not going to be effective because maybe a pipeline cannot process all that information. And if you're using RabbitMQ, for instance, for each connection that you have with the server, it will consume a couple of megabytes in the server. So with 100 producers, you're just going to have a lot of memory in the server. And then you start to create pipelines, your memory is gone. So this is where we are heading, and this is what we are working on right now. So uh, this is basically what I have for you uh, today. And and just quick, uh, what's next? It's uh, metrics and statistics. That is what we're working on. Uh, multiple processors, uh, Kafka connector. We are already working on it. And rate limit, and there's a bunch of other features. So, uh, if you if you want to discuss any other new features, like Emerson told you in his presentation, uh, there's a lot of features. There's a lot of issues that are open in, in, in on GitHub. If you're interested, you can look at the issue tracker, uh, follow the discussions. And if you have any questions, I'm going to be around. If you want to talk about Broadway or anything else, just uh, come by and say hello. So thank you. Give it up. Yeah.